in interest of everybody's time, I guess we'll get going and start with the presentation. Hi everyone, uh, welcome and thanks for joining in for today's webinar on the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger Program. My name is Pulkit Kathuria and joining me today are my colleagues, J.M. Toria, who works as an EV advisor uh, with Plugin BC and Michael Stanier, who is the program lead for the communications at Plugin BC. So Plugin BC is a program of the Fraser Basin Council it provides information and support around plug-in vehicles and charging infrastructure throughout British Columbia. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I respectfully reside and work on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Today's webinar is being hosted to provide information about the program and the application process for the next funding review round. The application submission deadline for the next funding review round is the 16th of December, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. PST. So this is the agenda for the webinar today. We'll begin with an introduction to the program, followed by going over the program process. After this, I'll delve into the details of some very important components of the program, including scoring preferences, site design, revised operations and maintenance calculator, costed, cost and budget expectations. And finally, I will be summarizing the application process. At the end of the presentation, we'll be opening the room for question and answer session. So the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger Program is intended to increase the number of public direct current fast chargers throughout British Columbia to support the growing number of zero emission vehicles on the road. The program aims to target current gaps in the public DCFC network in BC, such as indigenous communities, rural and northern areas, and city centers experiencing long queues for DCFCs due to high zero emission vehicle uptake. The program is being funded by the Ministry of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation uh, of the province of British Columbia and is administered by the Fraser Basin Council Society. So uh, a few important points about the program. Uh, so it incentivizes level three direct current fast chargers and level two uh, EV chargers as well for the use by general public. So it is one of the most basic and the most important requirement and, uh, of this program that the proposed chargers should be publicly accessible 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, so this is one of the few requirements that need to be fulfilled in order to be eligible for the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger Program. Applicants and the next requirement, uh, and uh, not a requirement, but uh, an important point about this program is the applicants must apply and be pre-approved for the program before any costs are incurred. So if any costs are incurred before the approval, uh, those will not be eligible for rebates. So I'll be going over the program process in the subsequent slides and um, you'll understand where the pre-approval uh, takes place for, for this particular rebate program. So as you could see on your screens, uh, this is the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger Program website. Information pertaining to rebates, eligibility criteria, application process could be found on the program website. The website also includes the program guide, which provides comprehensive information on these as well. So a recording of the webinar will be available on the program website after this session. If there is significant interest, we could also host a second webinar, the details for which will be available on our website. After the webinar, we will connect with those who were registered and attended the webinar and provide them with a list of required documentation and general process steps. A few aspects of the applications have been discussed in detail in subsequent sections of this presentation as well. So in addition to the webinar, we will also be providing application support sessions to the applicants throughout the application process. Applicants could reach out to us uh, with their questions and queries through email, and we could also set up telephone and Zoom calls. 
And finally, we'll be providing an application deadline reminder on the 9th of December. The application deadline submission, the submission deadline is Friday, 16th December, 2022 at 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So once a decision uh, has been made, the applicants will be notified by email if, about the results pertaining to their application. So these are the rebate amounts that are available for non-Indigenous and Indigenous entities under this program. There are three uh, power output categories, greater than or equal to 20 kilowatts up to 50 kilowatts, greater than or equal to 50 kilowatts up to 100 kilowatts, and greater than or equal to 100 kilowatts for DCFCs. And then you also, uh, since this program also incentivizes rebates for level two chargers, and one of the requirements for the level two chargers is that the, the output should be at least 32 amperes or greater. So there's a rebate amounts mentioned for the level two chargers for non-Indigenous and Indigenous communities as well. Of course, there are, uh, there are increased rebate amounts available for Indigenous communities. Um, so in, in addition to the power output of the EV charging stations, there are other factors as well that influence the rebates that you would be getting for your project. These include the capability of the EV charging stations to charge vehicles simultaneously. So multiple DCFCs are eligible for one rebate for each vehicle that can charge simultaneously at a given output level. The funding amount for multiport stations will be based on the maximum simultaneous output level of the operating ports. Next is the tandem installation. So I've explained this factor more on the next slide as well. It is one of the eligibility requirements. So if the prospective installation location is greater than 500 meters from the nearest public charger, be it level two or a DCFC, the project will be required to install at least two ports per site, either tandem DCFC stations or a DCFC and a level two to provide redundancy to the site. A multiport station on its own does not fulfill this requirement. I'll repeat, a multiport station on its own does not fulfill this requirement. You need to have two separate stations so that if one breaks down, you still have another station on site, which is working. For tandem installations, the, uh, for tandem DCFC installations, a 75% funding limit will apply while the combined dollar cap will remain the same. I'll go back to the slide, which shows uh, the rebate amounts and I'll show what it means. So if you look under the maximum rebate category for uh, non-Indigenous communities, it's up to a 50% uh, if it's uh, non-tandem, uh, if it's not co-located with other stations. So if you co-locate it, if you have multiple stations on the site, uh, if you're proposing multiple stations, it would go up to 75% of the project cost, but the combined dollar limit, the, the limits that have been mentioned here would remain the same. So uh, level two only locations. Uh, so this program is intended to primarily support public fast charging. However, public level two stations not required to be co-located with the DCFC station will be supported only in specific instances. So no public level two stations uh, without co-located DCFCs are eligible in Metro Vancouver or Capital Regional District through this program except for any of the Gulf Islands with one or fewer public charging stations or for indigenous owned stations. Uh, the next point is there must be one or fewer public level two or DCFC within 10 kilometers of this location if you're looking for installing only level two chargers in your project. Also, you'd uh, find a list of priority districts in the program guide under section 3.2.1 where only level two stations are allowed. Now we'll be going over some important components of the public charger program. The first one is the scoring preferences. So after the deadline date, that is once we have your final applications, we'll be scoring them based on certain parameters. So the pre preference will be given to applicants that 
fill existing DCFC network gaps and or are underserved areas, example, indigenous communities, rural and northern areas, and others. You could refer to the BC Public Light Duty ZEV Infrastructure Study by BC Hydro, which is available on our website. And uh, JM will also drop a link in the chat for the study. The next point is preference will also be given to applicants where the chargers are co-located with primary amenities, including lighting, washrooms, non-cellular wireless, that is Wi-Fi, to ensure internet availability at all times. Uh, preference will be given to applicants where there are multiple charges being co-located on the same side. That is, uh, if you co-locate um, more than one DCFC, you will be given preference. Next is, if these charges are co-located, are located near secondary amenities, such as restaurants, shopping, and attractions, example, parks, libraries, community centers, etc. Preference will be given if you include stations with an output of greater than 75 kilowatts when co-located, when, when located on primary and secondary highways, wherever feasible. If you include level two stations with a power, uh, with a power output of higher than, uh, of at least, or higher than 32 amperes, if level two stations are being proposed, then preference will be given in that case as well. Include an on-site Tesla Chai demo or a CCS adapter. It's optional, but then again, it's one of the points under preferences as well. Include capability to add DCFCs in the future. That is future for uh, uh, that is space for future expansion. Next is include the site design drawings in the application and include an operation and maintenance plan as a part of your original application. So the site design drawings and the ONM uh, plan have been discussed in detail, uh, in detail in the subsequent slides as well. So the next is uh, site design. Uh, site design is one of the recommended documentations that you could submit as a part of your application. It provides us an idea about the location of the EV chargers on the proposed site. You could demarcate the location of the electrical room and other electrical infrastructure available to support the proposed charging stations. And you could also demarcate the location of primary and secondary amenities. So another important aspect of the site design uh, drawing is to roughly depict that the site is accessible 24 by seven all around the year. For site design support, you should refer to EV fast charging design and operational guidelines for public DCFC stations by BC Hydro, the link for which will be available in the chat as well. So the next is the revised ONM calculator. So an ONM calculator provides you with a better idea of the operation and maintenance costs associated with the EV charging stations that you're proposing. We strongly encourage you to complete the ONM calculator. A revised template for the ONM calculator will be available soon on our website. So on this slide, you could see a screenshot of a portion of the ONM calculator. You could see a number of different operation costs like the electricity cost. And under the electricity cost, you could see costs such as demand charges, energy fees, and basic charges. The next is maintenance cost, under which you could find cost associated with routine maintenance, incidental damages, and others. After this, you could find other costs such as network fees, on-site customer services, cost associated with insurance, and others. Now, you could also see a table depicting the revenue. Uh, the ONM plan would also provide you an idea about the annual revenue generation from EV charging. So it takes into account a number of different data inputs. So once you complete the data inputs in the ONM calculator, you will have an idea about the average approximate annual operation and maintenance cost and the revenue as well. Okay, so the next important component and thing that you would be submitting as a part of your application is, the, is a, a budget quotation. So as a part of your application, yeah, so this would include 
cost associated with purchase and installation of the EV chargers. We use the budget provided in the application to calculate the rebate amount that would be set aside if the project is approved for rebates. As for our expectations, the budget should be as itemized as possible. This is because only eligible costs would be counted towards the rebates. Some costs eligible for rebates include DCFC or level two equipment. Here, I would also like to mention that there are equipment eligibility requirements as well, and these could be found in the program guide under section 2.3. Again, a link to the program guide will also be available in the chat here. Going back to the eligible costs, uh, installation costs including labor and material, which include which includes earthwork, paving of one parking space per charger, and curb or protective bollards around chargers and others are also eligible under this program. So for a complete list of eligible costs, uh, you could refer to section 2.4 of the program guide on page number six. So now I will be summarizing the steps an applicant goes through while applying or participating in the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger program. The first step is to look at the eligibility requirements and participate in the Clean BC Go Electric Public Charger program webinar. I will also mention that it is required for the applicants to attend the webinar or view the recording, which will be available on the program website if they cannot attend the webinar live. The next step is to apply for the pre-approval. This would involve submitting an application for pre-approval with required documentation by 16th of December 11, uh, 2022 uh, by 11.59 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. After we receive the application, the Ministry of Energy, Mines and Low Carbon Innovation will be reviewing it. They will be announcing uh, the results for the applications and we'll be reaching out to those applicants uh, uh, with their results. So the successful candidates and the applicants, um, uh, we'll, be sharing a, we'll, be, we'll be sharing and signing a funding agreement with them. The funding agreement will include the rebate amount calculated based on the budget quotation that you would be providing and other information as well in your application. So after the funding agreement is signed, the applicant gets 18 months, one eight, 18 months to complete the project. After completing the project, the applicant will be submitting the final documentation to us. And after this, the funding will be provided to the applicant. So this is the complete application process, starting from understanding the program till completing your project and getting the rebates. Finally, uh, I will mention that between now till the program deadline date, you could reach out to us on the following email ID, that is publiccharger at pluginbc.ca if, if you require any clarifications and if you have any concerns.